and that's the beautiful Shredagon Pagoda, uh, built 2,600 years ago, one of the most sacred Buddhist sites across Southeast Asia. Hello, welcome to Yangon, Myanmar, and welcome to this week's uh, lecture for UN Peace and Security. My name is Kevin Chang. I'm glad to be with you tonight, coming from Yangon, Myanmar, uh, where I'm based. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, various aspects of the UN's uh, support in post-conflict peace operations uh, in a multi-dimensional way, and we're going to take a particularly uh, field-based perspective in doing so. Um, just a little bit about myself. As I say, my name is Kevin Chang. I'm visiting scholar at the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies of University of Sydney. Uh, I'm a lawyer um, specializing in uh, international law, human rights, and conflict mediation over the past 15 years or so. Uh, uh, most of my work has been with the Australian government and with the United Nations. Uh, and between 2006 and 2012, I worked for various parts of the UN with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Pakistan, uh, with the UN Development Program, uh, both in Geneva, in the Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery, and also in Nepal as a peace building advisor. And also, um, lastly, um, more recently in Timor-Leste, where I was Chief Technical Advisor of Security Sector Reform uh, in the UN Integrated Peacekeeping Mission there. Um, I've also worked as a Senior Legal Officer in the Australian Government uh, at the Attorney General's Department, uh, worked on Indigenous Affairs and also have uh, been a Junior Advisor in the Fijian Government uh, earlier on in my career. Um, I'm, I'm currently based in Myanmar as an independent consultant. Uh, as far as CPAC is concerned, for the last four years, I've been involved in this course, teaching this course, UN Peace and Security, for various topics. Um, and uh, I also have designed my own um, course and run that for the past couple of years on conflict-sensitive development practice, uh, even though this year I'm relegated to the role of guest lecturer because I'm based here in Myanmar. So Jake Lynch will be uh, res primar primarily responsible for that course. Uh, I also teach, um, you may have seen me in Resolving Conflicts in organizations, helping Steve Lankin, and also uh, I'm involved in teaching human rights, peace and justice. So uh, quite a few subjects. As you enjoy the view back there, the Shredagon Pagoda. Um, now, just a little bit about this lecture. Um, you know, we're be gonna be going for about 55 minutes or one hour. Um, the views I express are, are my own. I'm an independent academic and lawyer at the moment, and I don't represent any views of the Australian government or of the UN. Let's go inside, it's really hot out here, it's about 35 degrees still, about 11 p.m. at night, so let's go inside and uh, we'll get the uh, this week's lecture going uh, in a cooler space. All right, back in more comfortable surroundings. So as I said, today's lecture is going to be on post-conflict peace support, uh, looking at a field-based perspective of multi-dimensional UN mechanisms. Um, now, what does all that mean? Well, that's just a fancy title, but really what we're going to talk about, um, as you can see in the slide, I hope it's working there, is a field-based look at the multidimensional nature of the UN's uh, peace support work in post-conflict contexts. Um, we're going to give you some examples of uh, the different post-conflict tasks carried out by the UN, um, and also in that process, look at how the UN coordinates and integrates its post-conflict support efforts among different departments and different agencies and a plethora of international and domestic actors. Um, and also, lastly, we're gonna have a look at uh, the UN's various mandates and approaches and ask you to consider um, whether some of them are complementary, uh, some of them may be um, clashing or contradictory in some cases. Okay, so if we can have a look at this um, diagram on the screen, um, it's really, You've probably seen this diagram before. It's a, it's a kind of an idealized um, representation or a scheme about uh, sort of different stages of a post-conflict scenario. So um, uh, at the top there, we have um, conflict prevention. And then I might just mention that there are particular, two particular milestones to mention. So firstly, we have conflict right there and peace agreement. So basically, um, the two milestones are firstly the onset of conflict um, and of course the time continuum goes that way as time goes, you know, as time progresses. The onset of conflict is one sort of particular milestone for this diagram uh, for you to take note and uh, the other one 
is, of course, the existence of peace agreement or the reaching of a cessation of violence. And that's right there, the peace agreement. Those two uh, red circles, I've just erased that for the moment. Um, so basically, as I said, this is an idealized scheme for the simplicity of teaching because, of course, immediately you, you might say, well, war and conflict and tension do not follow a linear progression. And that's totally true. And also conflicts can reoccur. So the assumption here is that you've got a, a linear path from preventing conflict to trying to make peace, uh, the failure to do so, there's an outbreak of war, and then after that you reach a peace agreement and then you have some kind of other activities. Well, of course, in reality, that's not what happens. But for simplicity's sake, let's just kind of go through some of these sort of really sort of basic concepts. So basically, as I said, um, this relates to uh, the pre-conflict and the post-conflict um, situation, and the different bubbles relate to various aspects of domestic or international support. Now, of course, we're, this is the UN class, we're gonna focus on the UN support. Now, in terms of conf conflict prevention, the bubble at the top, um, that really involves various measures, mainly diplomatic measures, to keep tensions and disputes from e escalating into violent conflict. Uh, so it may include early warning, uh, information gathering, analysis of factors driving root causes of conflict. Uh, some of the activities may include the use of Secretary General's good offices uh, or preventive deployment of UN missions or uh, mediation efforts. So that, that's conflict prevention. Now, as we go down, uh, obviously the outbreak of conflict will bring different kinds of measures. And, uh, you know, perhaps something that's very underutilized is peacemaking. And peacemaking generally refers to measures to address a conflict in already in progress and that involves diplomatic action to bring hostile parties to a negotiated agreement. So again, good officers, but also just sort of your, your sort of general kind of mediation work uh, where the UN or another international actor, an honest broker that's trusted by both parties or multiple parties can act as a neutral, um, third party neutral. Now this can be undertaken by the UN, of course, or national actors, uh, civil society, religious, Leaders, I mean, you know, for example, the South African um, um, process of reconciliation had a particular religious um, um, uh, sort of underpinning to that. Uh, official or non-official groups can also do so, you know, just basically a trusted party can be from a third country and it can be track one, track two, depending on um, where that takes place. So peacemaking can take place at different levels. Now, if we move across and if we look at peace enforcement, well, Peace enforcement in reality doesn't happen very often, but since we're talking about UN international interventions, uh, we do talk a little bit about peace enforcement just so we cover it. It doesn't happen a lot. It involves a application of a range of coercive measures, including the use of military force, but also sometimes uh, economic sanctions and political pressure. Uh, with And this requires the explicit authorization of the Security Council um, under um, under uh, Article, well, if it involves military force, under Article 42 of Chapter 7, if it involves some other kind of non-military uh, uh, measures, it may involve a, a combination of Article 6 or Article 7. Um, you would have, of course, learned about those things early on in this class. Um, so these are situations where the Security Council has decided that there has been uh, is either a breach of the peace or act of aggression or a threat to international peace and security and it, it decides to act uh, to address that situation. And of course, regional organizations may also be utilized under Chapter 7 or Chapter 8 of the UN Charter. Uh, now, if we move down to peacekeeping, well, peacekeeping... Now, peacekeeping operations don't have to be the UN, of course, and in fact, uh, it's better nowadays to use the term peace operations I'll sort of come to that in a second when we define peace operations. But UN peacekeeping operations are in principle deployed to uh, support the implementation of a ceasefire agreement or a peace agreement. Now that's traditional classic peacekeeping. Uh, they're often also required to play an active role in peacemaking efforts. Uh, so using the political diplomatic aspects of the Secretary General's role, especially the special representative of the, Sec of the Secretary General SRSG. Um, and they may also be involved in early peace building activities. Now, peacekeeping usually doesn't 
shouldn't be lasting a very long time, but of course, as we saw in East Timor, it lasted about 10 to 12 years, sort of came, left and came back. Um, Kosovo is a special situation. Um, if you look at other situations like Sierra Leone, it almost lasted for a decade, in fact, probably more than a decade. Don't have the dates off the top of my head. So in many, in many instances, even though peacekeeping is, if you look at the diagram, meant to be for a short period in the immediate aftermath of a peace agreement, quite often it gets dragged into kind of this down here, the sort of peace building or long-term um, sort of development kind of work. Um, that brings us to what is peace building? Well, oh, sorry, just one more thing about peacekeeping. Today's multi-dimensional peacekeeping operations really facilitate many aspects. So the traditional peacekeeping ceasefire agreement, securing the borders, uh, you know, monitoring arms, um, that's a very narrow sort of mandate. Today's peacekeeping tend to be quite multidimensional, involving political processes, protection of civilians, assisting in the disarmament of combatants, uh, uh, supporting the organization of elections, uh, you know, constitution making and so on, rule of law and human rights. So that's what we mean by multidimensional. It's moved away from the traditional sort of interstate, uh, you know, Kashmir situation where you're basically monitoring ceasefire and so on. Now, what do we mean by peace building? Well, peace building, I mean, of course, all of these have different sort of meanings by different, if, you know, the US Army would define it slightly differently. Uh, and they'll use other terms such as state building and other things. But really peace building, we are talking about the UN context, really aims to reduce the risk of uh, lapsing or relapsing into conflict by strengthening uh, national capacities to uh, manage conflict. So it's really, peace building, really the, really the other side of the coin, peace building is actually conflict prevention. So you see, this is where it kind of goes full circle because uh, a critical aspect of peace building is also about um, preventing conflict. So there you go, a bit of an arrow there. So conflict prevention is in fact actively happening the whole time, uh, before conflict, during conflict, and after conflict. There's never a time where you stop doing conflict prevention work. And this sort of um, difference between peace building and conflict prevention in many ways is a fairly artificial one as uh, some of the recent reports um, tell us, especially um, thinking of the, the HIPPO, the High Level Panel Report on Peace Operations, which you guys would have discussed with Wendy Lambour last week. All right, so peace building is really about laying the foundations for sustainable peace and then the sort of development actors also have a role, okay? And, and we'll discuss that a little bit. So it's about creating the conditions for long-term peace and development. Now, um, unfortunately, the UN's international community's record in uh, a building peace in the aftermath of conflict has not been a really successful one always. There's some really successful stories, but there's some stories that are um, really outright failures. So Kofi Annan said in 2005 in Larger Freedom, our record of success in mediating and implementing peace agreements is sadly blemished by some devastating failures. Roughly half of all countries that emerged from war lapse back into violence within five years. So that's a devastating statistics. Uh, half the civil wars that have stopped go back to civil war, basically. Mainly they're talking about civil wars here. So at this very point, back in 2005, there's a gaping hole in the international UN institutional machinery. There was no part of the UN that could effectively address the challenge of helping countries with the transition from war to lasting peace. So peacekeeping itself is not enough. Now, peacekeeping, of course, is usually a combination of uh, peacekeepers, the so-called blue helmets, military people, police, who are not military, of course, police are civilian, don't forget, police are very much civilian, unless you're in a dictatorship, then the police is under control of the military government, maybe, but police is usually civilian, under civilian control. I mean, military is also civilian, supposed to be under civilian control, but military has an explicit combat role, whereas, the, whereas police has a much different mandate. So police is usually counted as civilian, and of course, international and national um, advisors and UN officials, these are all civilian stuff, of course. So that's what your peacekeeping mission looks like. Now, but of course, if peacekeeping were to have a small mandate and a short mandate, uh, how can you help the country to move from war to uh, cessation of violence to lasting peace? Um, now, that five to seven to 10 year to 15 year gap period, that's where it's missing, back in 2005. Now, this was caused in part due to lack of strategic, coordinated and sustained international efforts. 
Now, in an effort to address that, this led to the creation of the UN Peacebuilding Commission uh, alongside the Peacebuilding Support Office and the Peacebuilding Fund that all of you learn about with Wendy Lambour over the last couple of weeks. Okay, So this is the link and a tribute to uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, Wendy's research. Now, so the complexity, though, of modern conflicts really demand, like I said, a multi-dimensional way of approaching post-conflict support, combining uh, political, military, civilian actions. Um, now, one critical thing is in terms of the time frame. That's a particular strategic challenge for UN actors. Uh, obviously, there is the need to deal with immediate short-term priorities. Now, they really relate to maintaining the ceasefire, maintaining the confidence of the parties, ensuring there are mechanisms where parties engage in dialogue rather than going back to war. Uh, there, are, there are, you know, real security needs, for example, and the UN may play a part there in, 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 in sort of guarding, reinforcing borders or monitoring ceasefire or helping um, the uh, warring parties disarm. So all of that relates to security. Um, and of course, in most situations, in war situations, you have a significant humanitarian crisis of displacement, either internally or displacement out of the country. Now, they may or may not be refugees under international definition. They may or may not be under persecution. Nevertheless, displacement, uh, there will be many people displaced and there are people of concern in terms of international uh, human rights, refugee and humanitarian law. Now, these people may be coming back when the war ceases or they may be still um, displaced. Uh, they may be they may have crossed international borders or not. So, you know, that gives rise to different sort of obligations under international law for protection. Um, so there's the humanitarian concern as well. Now, those are usually the short term, but then you've got to also address and plan the seeds for the medium and the long term uh, uh, objectives and outcomes. So they relate to peace consolidation, preventing conflict, social economic development, um, and really um, to address some of the root causes of conflict. Now, of course, human rights and transitional justice come in there sometimes. Unfortunately, from a justice perspective, human rights tend to be difficult to address in the early aspects of a post-conflict peace support effort, because quite often the international community believe there's a greater need to ensure that conflict doesn't come back again, and that political actors have confidence in each other to maintain the ceasefire. Now, quite often, the sacrifice there is addressing war crimes or crimes against humanity um, during the actual conflict, you know, torture, disappearances. Um, and we see that time and again in many countries, you know, Cambodia right next door here is just really, well, not quite right next door, you know, a direct flight away, is, um, has just been dealing with um, really the last um, six, seven years, dealing with the, the horrendous crimes of the Khmer Rouge, um, you know, back in the 70s. So um, I visited the extraordinary chambers last year, and um, it's, uh, a, you know, being really criticized, it's $200 million effort, and I think four, four or five of them have been um, um, prosecuted for, for war crimes. So it's a very difficult path, transitional justice. And this is where I'm sure you've discussed peace versus justice. Of course, it shouldn't be one versus the other, but quite often in terms of priorities and sequencing, it does become um, a little bit like that. Uh, so these are some of the sort of the challenges between short term and medium term. Uh, okay, so let's move on to what have we got next. Okay, now let's look at some of the key actors in a UN's uh, sort of post conflict support. Now, as I said, traditional peacekeeping may comprise of uh, a ceasefire monitoring, uh, a monitoring arms, uh, disarming rebels, uh, clearing mines. Uh, and, uh, you know, guarding borders and some of these kind of things. So the actors there, the key actors there, of course, Department of Peacekeeping Operations or Department of Field Support. Um, uh, I'm going to read out the acronyms just once and then you're going to learn it because you can rewind and hear me again. Um, security sector reform is another sort of big area that's really sort of, uh, you know, people have... I think it's really in the last sort of 10 or 15 years, international actors have come to a more coherent way of thinking about security sector reform. Security sector reform really dealing with, is dealing with reform of various security, the security apparatus of a country uh, that may have been involved in 
either dictatorship or conflict or you know military rule that gave rise to the violence uh, previously. So you know we're talking about the police, we're talking about the military, paramilitary, we're talking about insurgency groups, other armed groups. We're talking about maybe intelligence and the judiciary is there involved as well. So that's security sector reform. And of course, then we have all the issues dealing with the ex-combatants in terms of disarming, demobilizing them and reintegrating them back into society. So different um, um, actors are usually involved there. It's usually sort of part of the peacekeeping mission, but also UN, UNDP may be involved there and the High Commission for Human Rights and also UNICEF when it deals with child soldiers. Now, the conflict prevention of the political mediation work is there uh, you know, throughout really any sort of peacekeeping mission, there's always a political uh, affairs unit and civil affairs unit, which really sort of gauges the pulse of what's going on on the ground. Um, so some special political missions, which I'll mention later, uh, they're headed by the Department of, of uh, Political Affairs, other so-called uh, more sort of traditional or multi-dimensional peacekeeping missions are uh, headed by Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Look, there's no real formula really about when should something be a political mission, when should something be a peacekeeping mission. Now, political missions don't usually have military contingent, but you know, really in terms of the other kind of makeup in these missions, is sometimes it's a function of politics within the UN as well. Human rights and the rule of law are, you know, a really important task. You know, always CHR, UNDP, UNICEF, UNHCR as well. These are the main actors, humanitarian. OCHA is the Office of uh, Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. You're going to get a lot of these, so better get used to it because this is about what's happening on the ground. And what's happening on the ground is not only about what is being done, but who's doing it, right? Um, and also this will help in your careers. So if you want to apply for jobs in the UN, you need to know the alphabetic soup of the UN. I'm sure you have seen the UN chart already somewhere, so I'm not going to bring it up for you. The internet is a little bit slow here in Yangon. Um, so World Food Program, of course, uh, UNICEF, WHO, World Health Organization, and of course, sort of development, longer term development, post-conflict recovery work, UNDP, UNICEF, UN Population Fund, UNFPA, International Labor Organization, and so on. Got my cup from the uh, Australian Human Rights Commission where I used to work. Um, so these are some of the key actors of um, and tasks of post-conflict support. Now, this is another sort of diagrammatic uh, um, sort of representation, if you like. Uh, we have sort of the timeline going to the right-hand side and uh, just use the drawer. So we have time there going like that as time goes on. So it's another representation of Stabilization phase, that's another way of saying it. World Bank enjoys using that word. The British government used that word, DFID, the Department of for International Development. Uh, peace consolidation, so that line kind of represents, if you like, a ceasefire or peace agreement, and then longer term recovery and development. Some different sort of terms here. And of course, infrastructure, uh, employment, civil public administration, elections, these are some of the other tasks that I uh, probably mentioned a little bit before. Um, you know, the UN tend to focus on more on the human rights protection, civilian kind of work and development, but the infrastructure and other things are equally as important to um, not only um, as concrete measures to build peace, but also build confidence, right? Now, uh, okay, so now we're going to talk about what really are UN peace operations? Now, generally, uh, UN peace operations, there's no, there's no sort of hard definition. I mean, the definition is a bit harder when you talk about what's peacekeeping, but generally nowadays we say peace operations and they can encompass different kinds of peace uh, missions, if you like, uh, different kinds of peace support. And um, uh, generally the actions um, taken under the UN uh, charter. Uh, now, chapter six, of course, you would know this is a revision, is about Pacific settlement of disputes. They relate to various measures such as conciliation, mediation, adjudication, or di diplomacy, and, or measures under chapter seven, which is basically actions to deal with threats to peace. Um, they may be enforcement actions that may be diplomatic, economic, or military in nature. Okay, so peace operations could be any one of those. Now, yeah, but what are they? they 
they have mandates, they have people on the ground, they are actually doing things. So what do they actually look like? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, but firstly, uh, just elaborating from what I said before, peace operations are usually, they don't have to be, there's, there's nothing else saying this is a peace operation and a peace operation must be a Security Council mandate. But usually, of course, Security Council has the re primary responsibility for international peace and security. And therefore, when it deals with the matter of international peace and security, it passes a resolution. For example, sending a whole bunch of civilian and military into a situation, that's a pretty big thing, uh, dealing with threat to peace and security. So, of course, it is usually backed by a Security Council resolution. As And as you have studied the UN Charter, can't remember which article, I think 103 or something, member states undertake to implement decisions of the Security Council. In other words, Security Council decisions are legally binding under international law. Right, so they usually mandated peace operations under uh, a Security Council resolution, generally in the aftermath of a ceasefire or peace agreement. Don't forget, peacekeeping means keeping the peace. Peacekeeping doesn't mean uh, necessarily uh, making peace or enforcing peace. Most of the situations, there is the existence of a ceasefire agreement or peace agreement for a peacekeeping mission to be deployed. Now, the UN has made some mistakes in different places, a lot of controversy about what the UN did in Bosnia, of course, where really there was no um, a really ceasefire or peaceful situation for, uh, I think, UNPROFOR, I think, at the time to be uh, operating. And of course, they failed to protect the civilians in UN safe haven in Srebrenica. So there's been some examples of uh, peace operations where there was not sufficient peace to keep. So usually in the aftermath of ceasefire or peace agreement. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, I did already talk about peace enforcement, so I won't, I won't go back to that. But that's a different situation where you're really uh, using military force to, to make peace. You now that was one of the, Article 42 is one of the primary differences between the League of Nations and the United Nations. Right, so the UN peace operation is generally one of, one of the following functions, as I said, traditional peacekeeping or multi-dimensional peacekeeping operations. They tend to be most PKOs today, start using PKOs now. Um, Post-conflict stabilization missions are usually also one of them. Look, what's the difference? It's very, very hard to say, to be honest. Usually stabilization missions have more of a recovery humanitarian and sort of post-conflict recovery, kind of early recovery kind of angle to that. What does that really mean? I mean, post-conflict recovery missions tend to drag out a fair bit. If you look at MINUSTA in Haiti, it's going on and on. I don't know, I don't know how long. I think, I think 12, 13, 14 years. I mean, some of you can check. Definitely since the early 2000s. Special political mission, as I said before, they're usually uh, managed by Department of, Peace, uh, Department of Political Affairs, DPA, and they are focused on preventive diplomacy, good offices of the Secretary General, conflict mediation, facilitating dialogue among warring parties. Uh, they can happen before or they can have happen after a conflict, of course. If you have a peace agreement where you don't really need military support, you may have a political mission. However, as I said, there's no hard and fast rule and it, a lot of times depending on politics. I mean, Afghanistan in many places are in full, have been in civil war for many, for, you know, over a decade. Their mission, Yunama, is a political mission. So you try and figure that out. I can't. I don't think many people can. Um, it's part of the sort of mechanisms of how Security Council members discuss with each other about the most appropriate or the most feasible or the only capable intervention they can make at the time. Obviously, in a place with civil war, it's probably not good for a peacekeeping mission to be in there because there's no peace to keep. Is a political mission effective? It's kind of hard to say. I mean, but, you know, politics, political mediation is sometimes the only way. And that's my explanation to you about why it's a political mission in Afghanistan. But then, of course, those people who were intimately setting up the uh, UNAMA will probably give you a better answer to that. But I haven't heard a good answer yet about Hard and fast rule, what is peacekeeping and what is political mission, what is stabil uh, stabilization and what is multidimensional peacekeeping. Uh, it varies and it depends on what's written to the document, it depends on which part of the UN is managing that. Bit of rivalry to be between DPA and TPKO as well. Now, 
Right, I'm going to move on a bit quicker. There are other special missions, for example, the uh, uh, emergency response to Ebola. That was deemed to be a threat to international peace and security. There was a Security Council mandate special operation. Not quite a peace operation, nevertheless, dealing with threat to peace and security. Right. And of course, the UN country team is the, the whole sort of UN development people, uh, UNDP, UNICEF, UNFPA, WFP, all these guys, um, you know, just kind of doing stuff, not necessarily doing conflict prevention, you know, because they're usually there on the ground before, during, and after a conflict situation. Now, of course, there's usually a confluence between a conflict affected country and a country afflicted by poverty. They usually go hand in hand. They don't necessarily go hand in hand. I mean, poverty doesn't cause necessary conflict. However, most places that experience civil war are also developing countries at the very least and, and countries that are fragile and uh, have a low human development um, uh, index. Therefore, there is a link between conflict and development, which, you know, in other classes you guys will explore. Um, I've sort of spent my um, sort of career doing that kind of stuff, but, uh, you know, maybe I'll discuss a little bit if we have a few minutes left over. But because in conflict countries, in countries that experience conflict, they usually happen to be developing countries or poor countries, there is UN development presence there before whatever civil war, during civil war and after civil war, because it continues to be caught. So the question you may ask is, well, what are these guys doing to prevent the conflict? What do they do to address conflict triggers? Do they know conflict triggers? Good question. UN country team is usually there before, during, after conflicts. Um, so the UN presence in post-conflict situations, again, we've got a circular diagram. Uh, that's another sort of representation. You can have a look at this and see that there are different um, actors on the ground, usually development actors, humanitarian, political, and peacekeeping as well. And there you go, you have your alphabetical soup of UN agencies and departments and the UN country team, their development people basically. All right, so what are integrated peace operations? Now, the UN recognized about a decade and a half ago that really successful recovery from conflict requires greater engagement of all of the actors, not just the special representative of the Secretary General. Again, SRSG from now on. Uh, not just peacekeeping or not just other people doing humanitarian work on their own or they're doing sort of development work. It's like conflict is over, we just do development now. That's quite often what you hear from sort of classic development people who haven't dealt with conflict before um, they, and they don't understand the interaction between conflict and development. Right. Um, there was a recognition that all of the UN's presence must be based on a clear and shared understanding of the priorities in a post-conflict context and a willingness to contribute towards the achievement of those common objectives. So integration in UN peacekeeping is a, is, has been the guiding principle since about 2000, the Brahimi report. It came out in a, in a I think, Secretary General's report back in 1997. It's, it's been the guiding principle for the design and the implementation of complex UN operations on the ground. Now, this is about linking different aspects of post-conflict peace support, political, security, development, humanitarian, human rights, rule of law, into a coherent strategy. Now, is it just about strategy? Is it actually about action? Good question. So, integrated mission is really based on a common strategic plan and shared understanding of the priorities in post-conflict situation. Now, it's essentially the structural marriage of traditional peacekeeping with the existing UN country team that does development and humanitarian work. Well, how do you do that? Well, you put an emphasis on the role of the special representative of the Secretary General, and that person becomes in charge of the entire UN. Now, of course, the head of the UN country team, usually called the, the resident coordinator, in fact, always called the resident coordinator, he or she might, once you have a conflict and then a peacekeeping mission comes in, that person may be usurped by a SRSG. And who's SRSG mandated by? Security Council resolution. So you have a political process in New York now mandating possibly with military force, blue helmets, 
or a significant presence that now sits kind of on top of the UN country team that has been going around doing the development work maybe for decades and failing to prevent conflict, probably failing to see it or couldn't see it or too close in working with governments, you know, bad governments, and then the government gets toppled and so on. So the whole integration is about everybody working together towards common objectives in a post-conflict situation. But of course, sometimes there's tension because the head of the UN sort of development aspect of the UN architecture is now reporting, not necessarily reporting to, but definitely under, in terms of, in terms of uh, seniority, under the special representative of the Secretary General, who is usually an experienced sort of politician coming mandated from New York by the Security Council. So the SRSG is a senior UN representative with overall authority of the entire UN. This person represents the SG, and I won't say he because there's been many she's in the last um, you know, decade or so, there's been quite a big improvement there. Uh, and through him or her reports to the, uh, to the Security Council. Now, the deputy SRSGs, there are usually two of them. One of them is the head of the UN country team, the resident coordinator. In other words, the head of the UN before the SRSG came in and the peacekeeping mission came in. And the other one usually deals, so that person continues to deal with the sort of humanitarian development aspects. And then the other deputy is usually kind of like a you know, the person who's stronger on security, rule of law, human rights, SSR, that kind of stuff, DDR, right. Um, so UN integrated peace operations also go through a sort of integrated mission planning process. Uh, now this came in 2006. Um, I think I'll just skip this um, sort of, you can, you can read on the slides. And by the way, the slides will be available on Blackboard um, and uh, in a PDF file. So if you can't see the resolution here properly, go for the PDF file. Okay, so that's integrated peace operations. Now, uh, give you two practical examples that I personally served in. So first one is the UN integrated mission in uh, Timor-Leste. Um, now, this is a mission that existed, uh, I think it's 2007. 2000, uh, 2006 to 2012, it wrapped up in December 2012. I was there between 2011 and 2012. Um, and basically, um, it was a integrated peace operation. In other words, integrating uh, political, security, humanitarian and development efforts in a post-conflict situation. Now, of course, the UN has been in Timor-Leste, of course, um, prior to that. Uh, the UN assisted in the referendum in 1999. Um, Australians would know this as sort of General Peter Cosgrove, who's now the Governor General of Australia. He led the International Intervention Force, Interfet, uh, and of course that was authorized by Security Council under Regional Arrangement, Chapter 8 of the UN Charter. And, um, and the UN sort of, sort of came in and took over after that. Initially it was UNTAYET, which was the UN Transitional administration until molested, and then there's a couple of things, uh, you know, till the, there's another one I can't remember off the top of my head. Anyway, uh, the UN left in 2005, but then um, kind of civil war broke out again, uh, especially conflict between the military and the police. UN came back in 2006, set up an integrated mission. So basically, um, if I show you uh, a few personnel here, this gentleman here was the uh, chief of the UN police. Uh, from Portugal. Um, uh, this colleague, her name is Amira Haq from Bangladesh. Uh, she uh, was the special representative of the Secretary General, is now Under Secretary General for Department of Field Support. This is Mr. Shigeru Moshida, who was the uh, one of the DSRSGs for Rule of Law, Security, and Human Rights. And then this was uh, uh, Mr. Finn Ruska Nelson. Um, I think he's retired now, um, but uh, he was the uh, uh, resident coordinator of the UN uh, country team and therefore of course the uh, the other deputy special representative um, and uh, this was just us signing a security sector reform um, initiative with UN police so uh, there's me right there and there's a UNDP country director there now just give you an example of what the UN UNMIT looked like between 2006 and 2012 um, so, like I said, there's a SRSG at the, at the top here, and then you have 
two DSRSGs, one of them responsible for security sector rule of law. And then under this person, you know, you have the police, you have military liaison, uh, security sector support, which is where I worked, and also human rights. Now, each mission looks different, and this diagram is also incomplete, okay? So this is just a representation for master's students. Um, the, the other DSRSG, of course, is the head of the entire UN country team. And each UN country team may have 100, 200, 500 people, it depends on which country you're in. And uh, so, you know, all of them are shoved in this sort of uh, tiny diagram here, the UN country team. And, and then, of course, there's a usual sort of peacekeeping mission um, uh, kind of, uh, sort of teams where you have political affairs and civil affairs on the right hand side there, mission analysis, JMAC, and so on. So that's UNMIT in Timor-Leste. Now, another one uh, that's a little bit different is the post-conflict peacebuilding presence of the UN in Nepal, really from 2007, still now. I mean, now it's really winding back. I mean, there's no mission there. But at the time, some of the main work that the UN did at the time in Nepal included uh, support to constitutional building. Uh, in fact, constitution was passed last year and you heard there was a lot of violence last year um, and still ongoing in different parts of the Tarai. I was there with UNDP between 2009 and 2011. Uh, there was the disarmament and demobilization of ex-combatants, dialogue facilitation for political leaders and good officers of the UN, Secretary General, uh, conflict sensitive approaches to development as well. Uh, of course, um, the picture down here in the uh, in the bottom left is about uh, arms monitoring here. That's uh, SRSG, Mr. Ian Martin from Britain there. Um, and of course, this was the peace agreement uh, um, between the Maoists and the other political parties. Uh, so, and there was electoral support early on with the first uh, election of the condition constituent assembly as well. So this is a bit of a diagram of the um, UN country team with the special political mission. So UNMIN was a special political mission on the left hand side here. So they did arms monitoring, mine action, electoral assistance, ceasefire monitoring, political civil affairs. There was a separate office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Now sometimes OACHR is part of the UN country team, but this OACHR had a kind of its own mandate uh, that came here in 2005, even before the mission to investigate um, human rights abuses by both sides. Of course, a lot of disappearances uh, done by both sides. Um, and of course, then on the right hand side, you have the UN country team as per usual, before, during, and after a conflict. Okay, um, so that's a little bit of example of um, Nepal. Okay, now delivering as one. Uh, not much to say here, other than that um, um, the UN realized that in terms of its development work, it, it also should uh, deliver as one, one UN, not be competing with each other. So it was really about making the UN system more effective, coherent, and relevant. And uh, there were several recommendations. There should be one leader, one program, one budget, and where appropriate, one office. Now that really hasn't happened in almost anywhere. Um, you know, there's one program which is called UNDAF, but then the way you do the UNDAF, UN Development Assistance Framework, is usually different agencies are doing their own things, and then UNDAF exists as more of a document than a framework that drives every other agency. Uh, delivering a while, I'm really not sure where it's at. Um, it's, uh, it, there were eight initial pilots and, um, you know, do some research, but uh, I'm not sure if there's any more delivering as one. Uh, certainly hasn't be, been talked about for quite a while. Right, um, so for the last bit of today's uh, lecture, um, let's look at really look deeply and consider some of the mandates and approaches of all these different parts of the UN, but they're meant to be working together towards common objectives, but are they carrying the same mandate? Who gave them the mandate? What is the mandate? Are they mandates under legal mandates? Moral mandates? Let's have a look. UN peacekeeping operations, I mean, you know, sort of taking one step back in, in, instead of looking at the mandates, um, let's look at the principles of UN peace operations. Well, any UN peace operation require consent of the parties, of course. If, 
if parties don't consent, the UN being there, the UN will be attacked, the UN can't do its work. It requires impartiality, which means basically the UN is not biased towards any uh, party in conflict of conflict. And also it requires the non-use of force, accepting self-defense and the defense of the mandate. So the exception there is really if the UN is attacked or the UN itself actually, um, um, well, or, or the UN is not able to implement its mandate or in limited circumstances, it's actually a peace enforcement mandate, then you can use military force. But generally, UN peace operations, no military force is used unless in self-defense. So where are these principles derived? Or well, really, I mean, they're principles, but UN peace operations, where do they derive their work from where? Uh, well, Security Council resolutions and also status of forces agreements signed between the UN and the host country. Don't forget the host country here, okay? Now, these are peacekeeping mandates. If we look at um, humanitarian assistance, what's humanitarian assistance all about? Well, humanitarian assistance are delivered by different actors, sometimes in conflict situations, sometimes not in conflict situations. So there's not a one set of principles that govern the entire spectrum of humanitarian assistance. And in many ways, one of the problems with the humanitarian assistance is that humani so-called humanitarian, humanitarian work has now taken on a much broader meaning than it used to be. Uh, the, the sort of the purest of the pure humanitarian assistance is the work done by ICRC, which is done in the middle of conflict. You know, of course, generally refugee work, generally sort of food security and other work is also regarded as humanitarian assistance, not necessarily in the middle of conflict. That kind of work, of course. A lot of refugee work, of course, is done cross-border, of course, uh, the destination of um, displaced people. But if we take the purest meaning of um, humanitarian um, assistance, then the principles are fourfold. Firstly, um, the um, human suffering must be addressed wherever it's found. So the humanitarian, the purpose of humanitarian action is to protect life and ensure respect for human beings. So that's humanity. Impartiality is really about humanitarian actors not taking sides in hostilities or engage in controversies of political sort of nature. Neutrality is not the same as impartiality. Neutrality in humanitarian action is about the fact that it must be carried out on the basis of need, giving priority to the most urgent cases without any distinction of which side of conflict, nationality, race, religious belief, class, or political opinions. So that's neutrality, purely based on need. Everybody is deserving of help. POWs, rebels, um, government armed forces, and the like. And one important aspect of humanitarian assistance is operational independence, which is basically where humanitarian action must be autonomous from political, economic, military, or other objectives. Um, because this is how humanitarian actors can attain access because they are apolitical and independent to any government or organization's agenda. Now let's just lastly look at some of the humanitarian uh, development of census principles. These are the so-called Paris Declaration Principles on Aid Effectiveness. And development is really about local or national ownership. The nation, national ownership is not the same as government ownership, but in many cases it's implemented as if national is synonymous to government. National here just means not international, but in many cases it's really the government is in the driver's seat, the government decides, and national actors are there to support the government achieve its development aims. Uh, there has to be donor alignment to country systems. In other words, donors shouldn't try to create parallel structures, donors shouldn't try to fight each other, and that leads to harmonization as well. Now, there has to be a focus on results because if you've seen developing activities, if you've seen developing countries, they tend to go on and on for decades, and sometimes the development project can go for 10 years. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Development should be focused on um, specific targets and results, and uh, the results must be measurable, and when the results are achieved, that's when development actors, international actors, should exit.
because the capacity is built, the results are achieved, targets are met, time to get out, time to put yourself out of a job. How many development actors do that? When we are marching down Newtown or Richmond in Victoria or anywhere else, and arguing for more aid, which is generally a good thing. Does anyone say, hey, hang on, we should have less aid because we're supposed to have achieved certain things, so we should be phasing out. Imagine if somebody said that. People will accuse this person of being in some kind of right-wing agenda or something, you know. But um, what is the merit in arguing for higher quantity? If you want to argue for higher quantity, what is your plan in terms of results? Now, most people in capital cities such as Canberra, Washington, or London are not engaged with results. They're not engaged with what's happening on the ground. So development is not about arguing for how much money. It's about arguing for what outcomes and what approaches. Those are more important than money. But unfortunately, money is easier to digest for most people. And the last thing is about donor partner mutual accountability have to be accountable for results, have to be accountable for the money you spend, have to be accountable. The accountability goes in many ways. Accountable to taxpayers from donor countries, accountable for the people in need, accountable to the vulnerable people, accountable for, the, for people whose human rights are most at risk. There you go. So the mandates for development assistance, well, it's really between countries, between country and the UN. It's really like that, you know, the host state, basically. All right, so in the last bit of our um, discussion, Okay, so just sort of finish off there, sorry. Uh, for you to consider, and you know, we'll, we'll bring to next Saturday's lecture, uh, what are the similarities, differences, complementarities, and tensions between peacekeeping, humanitarian development principles and approaches? How may, how may these mandates and approaches present uh, challenges and, and difficulties in the field and or opportunities? So that's for you to ponder, and we can have a little bit of chat about that in our um, um, collaborative discussion session. Uh, I'll just take a couple of minutes on the last sort of couple of slides. Um, what is the, uh, you may have heard of this thing about conflict sensitive development. Somebody just mentioned that, that there's a course that I designed at CPACS, um, and I'm not able to run that anymore, um, but it's being offered in uh, uh, July this year in winter school. Now, conflict sensitive development is really about doing development properly. That's really what it's about in conflict situations. Because when an organization like the UN or any you know, World Vision or Oxfam or um, anybody who's you know, DFAT, uh, you know, purporting to provide development assistance, when an organization operates in a conflict-affected situation, for example, post-conflict Sierra Leone, it becomes part of the conflict. You can say, well, how so? They're not taking up arms. No, but they're becoming part of the conflict context. The context is affected by conflict. So you come in with resources, you become part of that context. That's what's meant by that. So any intervention to bring in resources, development, peace building, humanitarian assistance, in conflict affected context has an impact, has an impact on that context. Now, most people assume that if I'm providing water and sanitation in post-conflict Sierra Leone, I'm providing basic health to a village population. It can only be a good thing. So it can only be positive. Well, that may be intuitively the case, that may be your intention, but any impact can be positive or negative. So as we said, you become part of the context. What if the water supply you provide uh, is hijacked by particular armed groups? What if you need access from particular political actors uh, who abuse human rights in order to have access to those villages, and so on and so on. What if your procurement gets captured by armed groups and so on? There's all that kind of stuff. What if there's corruption? So don't assume all development output, which means what I give, will turn out to be a positive result, what is being felt by the communities. That assumption is an erroneous assumption. That assumption leads to development doing harm and conflict in, being conflict insensitive. That's what conflict sensitivity is about. It's about understanding that development and peace building interventions also are inherently political. Why is that? Because all of them are 
aim to achieve change. What is development if you're not there to, to achieve change? Most development agencies go by a particular theory of change in the rationale of their programming. So they aim to achieve change, such as empowering local populations, um, strengthening government institutions, or uh, liberating vulnerable groups, and so on. This uh, so usual sort of slogans that you may hear. Now, they aim to achieve change through normative determinations. In other words, it's better to have poor people having access to water because it's a human right. It's better for those people who don't have access to education to access schools. It's better to have gender equality. It's better to have freedom of movement, freedom of association. Those are normative determinations. So you're there to achieve change. Now, of course, that's a good thing. But deliberate choices are made that can generate winners and losers. What happens when you generate winners and losers? Generate conflict. So, got to be conflict sensitive in the way you de deliver development assistance uh, to avoid exacerbating tension and maximize potential uh, peace building and conflict prevention and development impact. So really, conflict sensitivity is about the capacity to understand the con context you're operating, to understand the interaction between your what you're bringing and the impact it's having on the context, and to act on this understanding to make sure you avoid negative impact, do no harm, and maximize the positive impact to good. So that's a little bit about how to do development work properly in a conflict uh, affected context. So it's 58 minutes and 54 seconds. So time to perfection. And uh, that means I gotta get out of here within about 70 seconds. So um, thank you for having me. And I look forward to the interaction with you in the next week or so, both for the online module for UN Peace and Security and also the uh, in-class session where I'll be dialing in by Skype and we'll have an interactive, uh, uh, you know, um, multi-dimensional uh, facilitated discussion with Wendy and with Ayal there in Sydney. So uh, thank you. I hope you had a, a, an interesting time and I hope you enjoy the views of Yangon. Uh, learn a little bit about uh, the Buddhist um, history here and learn a little bit about the UN post-conflict support in the process. So it's hitting one hour now. I got to go. So I'll see you around and hopefully we'll, I'll see you um, sometime in Sydney or um, across the internet again from some post-conflict situation. Okay, bye for now.